Welcome to The Hustle with Ben Anderson, highlighting a series of inspirational success stories with celebrities, entrepreneurs, athletes, and industry-leading professionals. Ben has learned and mastered the art of the hustle, which has allowed him to become a top 20 USA loan originator and the number one mortgage and real estate finance coach in America, who has closed more than $3 billion in real estate finance transactions. So sit back, listen, and learn with The Loan King about money and mortgage. Welcome to The Hustle with your host, myself, Ben Anderson, coming live from Manhattan, New York, with a fast friend, JC. Thanks for being here, my friend. Thanks for having me. Look, man, your name is huge. Jonathan Casillas. In this area, people know you because NFL, Saints, and you finished with the Giants. And uh, we had a great time hanging out when we were back in San Diego a short while ago. And I was lucky enough to be your golfing partner. And uh, I felt like we became really tight. So... I wanted to have you here because it was good to tell your message to me in, in, the, in the golf cart, but I think that our audience needs to hear your story because it wasn't always so easy. But let's put it on the table two Super Bowl rings. That, uh, that doesn't happen very often. So you're in a rare caliber of athlete that's got two championship rings in their case. So before we talk about that, I want to talk about what it took to get there and the man that you are today and how you give back and, and share the love and, and, and have... Uh, just a great heart for uh, for people. So, tell me about your day. What's going on so far? What's good? Well, not much, man. I had this, you know, this day circled on my calendar. Beautiful. I didn't realize I was going to be a part of, you know, a Guinness record. Book records, yeah, baby. Let's I'm, do I'm it. excited about that. I was showing up regardless because right. you know, we had a nice little uh, yeah, a day together on we the did. golf course. Seven man. hours, you can know someone pretty. It good. was good. It was good, you know. And I, I do, I did feel like we connected and. Um, Good times. Good times. I had a lot of fun, and you know me, man. I was talking to everybody. You were just a But then around. I always come back and talk to you. That's like, right, yeah. Hey, man, you know, yeah. come back. I mean, you were just entertainment for me. Because my <laughs> life, having just not the excitement that you do, it was just good to hang out with that, with it your energy. Fun, it was a lot of fun. It was good times. So talk about, you know, your, people look at the two rings and, and, and the 52 uh, chain and, and, the, and, and the teams you played on, but... You know, like myself, you didn't grow up with the traditional household, and a little chip comes from having a rough upbringing. I want to talk about where you're from and, and how you grew up. Well, I'm from Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, my mom is a Puerto Rican woman. She was born in Puerto Rico. They moved here, um, I think, when she was like one or two years old. Um, so she's been in Jersey like all her life. Um, my father's African American. He's in Jersey as well. Um, street legend basketball player like a basketball street legend in, in Jersey City a lot of people know him um, my three years with the Giants he was basically the Giants mascot <laughs> um, any team I played for um, you know he would you know show up big time and you know down in when I played for the Saints for the first four years of my career he had a mask he actually still wore the mask the Mardi Gras mask the purple mask that he got years ago and he still would wear it to the Giants games um, you know, so I've always had that support, um, you know, but growing up in Jersey City, you know, it's, um, it, it was, you know, I, I didn't realize I was poor until I was older, you know what I mean? Because we, my mom, you know, she raised us, you know, mom and dad were separate, um, you know, she raised us with love and care, um, you know, I didn't realize that we didn't have much until I got older and realized what everybody else had, um, but there's, there's happiness you find there, you know, and, um, through that whole process, there's there's grit that's formed. There's um, um, you know tenacity, you know that uh, that definitely gets built up. You know it's like a callus. You know what I mean? It just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And um, you know from where I'm from, you know a lot of people don't make it out, and even if they get to certain stages, you know they don't always pan out um, because you know they kind of get pulled back, but not in a positive way. You know, in a, in a negative way. And, that's why I continue to try to do the things I do in Jersey City, in New Brunswick, in my hometowns, um, to give to give back and show these kids and um, people, you know, my peers and, and under, you know, show show them that you know we are the leaders and we need to lead our future leaders, um, inspire them and help them as much as possible, um, you know. But uh, Jersey City, New Brunswick, they're the places I call home. Um, I always represent them um, wherever I'm at. I have a chip on my shoulder, um, and everything I did, you know, growing up was all for my mom. You know, now that I have an eight-year-old daughter, everything's for her. You know, so it was all about family for me, and um, 
you know, uh, I'm inspired by my mom, how she, you know, basically raised three, five, ended up being five kids, but three kids on welfare. We're taking buses back in the day. And, you know, um, like I said, she never, I never knew I was poor until I got older, you know, and I, I think that's a kudos to my mom. She did a great job. I mean, because kids would, oh, I don't have this, I don't have those shoes, but if you didn't feel that way, then, then she won. For Big sure. Time. Yeah. You know, I was the kid, you know, we would get one or two shoes a school year, maybe maybe three for the year. Three was like maybe. a good year. Right. But you know, an active kid like me, you got to have your, your outside shoes yep. and you got your school shoes. Yep. So I was the toothbrush, you know what I'm saying, with yep. the soap. Mm-hmm. I still do that to this day. You know do, what I mean? do you think that in part and partial you were sharing with me and I seen you, you're the only guy I've seen golf 18 18 holes with clean Jordans on. I mean, all white, too. All white. And when you finished, they were cleaner than when you started. So I think that's in the record book for the cleanest Jordans on the golf course. So do you think that part of your love for shoes is because you didn't have shoes growing up? I think a little bit. You know, I wouldn't consider myself a sneakerhead because that would be, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, not a good pitch for it. I mean, there's real sneakerheads yes, out there, you yes. know, that do a lot. You know, I just, if I see it, I get it. You know, sometimes I can't get them because I'm a little late on release dates. But I do have an appreciation for shoes. Um, I like my shoes clean. Very. You know, and, um, you know, a lot of a lot goes in when you meet somebody, you look at their shoes. You, you always know, you do, look at yeah. the outfit, you know. And, um, not that I'm judging, but maybe a little bit. <laughs> you did, but if you take care of your shoes, you take care of your life, I think. Right, right, for sure, for sure. So, and I, I think part of the chip, the things you're doing now... The chip got you to the NFL, and we'll talk about unpacking all that. But the things you're doing now, I think, is where the chip is really going to be most useful for you. Because in the business world, it's not NFL. You can you can win off hard work, talent, and athletic ability. But in this whole business world, oh, it is sharks, and you're doing very well. So that chip, you're coaching your friends to get better. I think that's where where that chip really is going to shine the most. So let's go back towards your childhood. You're, uh, you still look like you can play. Um, I mean, you're still in ridiculous, stupid shape. So were you always a child athlete that was just great at playing sports? Your dad was a playground legend. Was that just in you? <laughs> yeah, I was a big basketball player when I was younger. Um, I remember, like, early days playing soccer for, like, some camp when I was, like, six years old. Um, I didn't start playing football until I was 14, though. You know, um, before that, I was an avid basketball player every day. You know, you'll catch me with the basketball in my hand. I live right down the street from Feasters Park in New Brunswick, and every day you would catch me in that park, every day, no matter how hot it was. And, you know, I'll play one game of basketball now, LA Fitness, I'm out for like two oh, weeks. <laughs> hamstring. <laughs> back backs. in the day, you yeah. play all day Saturday, all day Sunday, go to school on Monday, play after school Monday, like yeah. all day lunch. long. Play at lunch. You know, play at play lunch. Play you know, all day, you know, and, you know, it's a little different now, um, you know, but I still. I still have appreciation for basketball. I love um, fitness. I love moving. You know what I mean? Um, I, I've done Pilates. Uh, I, I've done yoga, Bikram yoga. I've done hot yoga. Um, I like, you know, the mobile. I, I do boxing now, you know. Um, it, it's it's a supplement for competition, and it's a supplement to get active, but there's nothing like football. Nothing you know? like football. And, and I learned that when I was 14. What was your um, first football experience? Well, my, my, my freshman year, um, you know, starting to play football, I wasn't really that good. Um, one, of the, one of my best friends that I used to live in Jersey City with, he was playing for South Plainfield. His name is Marquise Jones. He was an outstanding basketball player, but he was actually playing football at the time, and we were freshmen. I didn't know who he was until we were at the varsity game three days later, because I think we played Monday and they played Friday. So freshmen played Monday and they played Friday. So we, we caught them at the end of the week. We're at the varsity game. And I looked at him and then all my boys was like pointing at him said, that's the dude that ran you over for a touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> but then I looked at him and he was my, he was like my best friend in the third grade. And um, we ended up being good friends. His basketball career panned out like how my football career did. He started as a freshman in basketball and um, I didn't start till my junior year. Um, you know, but I've always, was an active guy. I'm a competitive. Uh, I'm a competitor at nature. Um, you know, I was in uh, drama class, and my drama teacher in high school, he was juggling, and I was like, oh, and I tried to juggle, and I couldn't juggle. So I took that upon myself to teach myself how to juggle. The next day, I was juggling. You know what I mean? But like, that's just how I always been. You know, and um, you know, uh, 
when you when you accomplish certain things physically, you know, it does something, you know, for you. You know, um, um, we're all men, you know, and, and even women too. It's 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 not even like when I say man, I'm not. It's not more like it's not like a sex thing. It's more of like like a bravado, you know, like a moxie. I'm from Jersey, yes. you know what I mean, and we have that moxie, you yes. know. It's like being tough, you know what I mean, and being able to do things that people say you can't do, yeah. you know. And um, that's just how I was raised, and you know, from being a freshman, getting ran over by a basketball player, yes. to you know my junior year having all the offers, you know, and that I've had, and you know, being an all-state player, and you know, being an all-state player in basketball and track. Um, you know, I, I take, you know, I, I take a lot of, um, you know, a lot of pride in that, you know, and, um, and um, I also, I was a good student as well, you know, I was a scholar athlete in the county, you know, um, in Middlesex County, and one of my, like, greatest accomplishments was getting that award, because it wasn't just about the physical um, fitness did, that I put did, myself did you Do you take on this scholar mindset because you didn't fit the scholar traditional look or feel no you know why because in in my environment in my demographic in the environment I grew up in we all looked the same you know what I mean right. <laughs> there, you know there was there was only brown and black you know what I mean there wasn't really right. nothing else you know so you know for me I was setting my own path you know um, I followed you know Muhammad Ali's Michael Jordan of course in my era I was growing up I loved Allen Iverson you know so um, people like that Bob Marley, Bruce Lee, yes. you know, people like that, they're not just what they do or what we see on TV, they're a lot more than that. You know, he was a philosopher, you know, like he taught philosophy, you know what I mean? He not only did um, 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 Kung Fu, but he studied boxing. Yes. The reason why Ali, um, Ali, the reason why um, Bruce Lee bounces the way he does, which you don't really see That's true. because he studied Muhammad Ali. Right. You know, so like I, I've done that in my life. I've studied, you know, former players. Uh, Lawrence Taylor is a, like, of course, everybody loves Lawrence LT, Taylor, but yes. I studied LT. Um, you know, so I've always had that about me, you know, and um, that, you know, very much helped me being not just a football player, you know, me being kind of like an all encompassing athlete. And part of why me, I've studied you as a football player because, you know, I'm a gigantic football fan, you know. Uh, you were, you really studied the game and you knew, you had angles. You knew how to make the right play because you played middle linebacker. So you're kind of quarterback on the defense. So the mindset of a football player, people think it's just tackling and grabbing. It's, it's, it's studying more than anything else. Sure. For and sure. analyzing the defense. So you're a great all-state athlete. You decide to go to college. Why did you pick Wisconsin? Well, I was um, I was a three-star recruit, which is not like the highest of high. Um, Malcolm Jenkins, he plays for Philadelphia Eagles. I won a Super Bowl with him. He's a two-time Super Bowl champ too. Twenty-seven. With the Eagles. Right? Yep. He's from Piscataway. He was five-star recruit, and you know, even though we were like kind of rivals, you know, like we still like stay in contact, and um, you know, but e ever since, ever since way back when, um, you know, when I was, I got recruited by Ivy Leagues first because I was a scholar athlete. My grades were very, very good. I could, you know, get to any school, um, you know, and I had that in my back pocket. Duke, I think, was the first letter I ever got. Like Colgate, Brown, you know, the, like the oh, Ivy yeah. Leagues, you know, <laughs> and then like the real Division One schools. I think not that Duke is not, but I'm saying like uh, the real football centric. Yeah, schools. like the football dominant Iowa and, uh, and um, um, I guess North Carolina is not really a football school; it's a basketball school. But like a lot of the East Coast schools, um, I took a visit to Illinois, Connecticut. My best friend ended up going there, and um, in Kentucky. When I took my visit to Wisconsin, though, it just felt like the right place to be. It was two degrees. I went in the wintertime. It was two degrees and it was during finals. So it wasn't like a big, like, time to really be visiting, you right. know, because it's very cold and it's like everybody's studying and it's not really like the party scene, you know. So what was it about Wisconsin? It, it, was, it was so many different things. Um, a lot had to do with the education I knew I was going to get there. I was, um, I went in, my major was computer engineering. I was an engineering 
um, part of the RIME engineering program, Raritan's Introduction to Minorities Engineering, since I was in the seventh grade. Right. Um, really good at science and math. Um, you know, so I picked Wisconsin, not only because they were a powerhouse in football, I felt like I was gonna get a good education. And Barry Alvarez at the time was the athletic director and the head coach. And, you know, he just made me feel like I can go there and they'll take care of me. And it's beautiful. I went there not that long ago. Rolling Green Hills, Madison is gorgeous. Beautiful. Estate, you would never think, but go there and you you feel like you're... Unbelievable. In the- it sits on two lakes. The campus is amazing. The stadium, you could barely see it because it sits in the middle of campus. People, and like... I mean, they love... It's they huge, football. but you could like, you could drive right by it if you're not paying attention. Right. You know, but it's 90,000 in there rocking. Rocking. Every, and back every, then it was a big 10. And so you played the Ohio State. Yes. You played uh, Michigan State. Yeah. You played uh, in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Played Michigan, yeah, the big house. There, yeah. You know, so you, <laughs> no slouch. The Wisconsin's a, those are some good teams you're playing. Yeah, for sure. So what was your college experience like? And, well, uh, and it, what, what memories or games pop out to you? We talked about that a little bit when we were hanging out. but Right, right. Well, you know, my college experience was fantastic. My senior year was a little bitter, bittersweet for me. Um, you know, and I'm planning on being real honest and just letting you guys know, like, what I went through, you know, because yeah. there was a reason I didn't get drafted. Um, you know, starter as a sophomore, if I'm not mistaken, I had, like, 90 tackles, 10 TFLs, three sacks. Which, and it's, like, an 11-game, 10-game season. Right. So and it, 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 that would translate to, like, 150 in the end. Right, right. And that was my sophomore year, you know, first starting, you know, and then I had a good junior season. And then going into my senior year, I was had all the preseason hype, you know, preseason All-American and Big Ten and all that good stuff. Um, then right before, uh, in the middle of training camp, I think it was our first scrimmage between, you know, red and white against each other, I, like, tear my knee up really bad. And um, I got misdiagnosed by Wisconsin several times. And it sucks because, you know, as a 19, 20-year-old, you know, to about the 20, yeah, 20, 21 year old, you know, you, you don't really know too much about the human body. You don't know what, what, what injuries, you know, you don't know what a torn meniscus really means. You That's know, right. you don't know what a torn MCL means. Um, you know, and they told me I had a torn MCL and I didn't get an MRI, which I know now as I've played 17 MRI. years of football. You didn't get an MRI? Because I trusted what they said, you know, and, and, they told me I had a, a, a sprained MCL, and I know MCLs now that take anywhere from two to four, maybe six weeks, but you can come back. You know, you have a brace on, you come back, you play. Um, but when I came back, my knee got worse. And this is my senior season. I'm all everything, you know, before the year. And I've been, I've had injuries before. I've always played dinged up, but nothing as significant as this. And I came back and I wasn't the same player because I was literally hurting. Um, and as the season went on, I got worse. You know, I was literally limping my senior year playing, you know, on the, on, the, on the field. And it sucked because towards the end of the year where I was training for the bowl game, we were playing Florida State um, in the Champ Sports Bowl. In the first day of practice, I get out there for, you know, we've, I think we had like a couple days off, and now I'm back at practice. I'm limping. And my coach is like, hey, you know, you all right? I was like, man, you know, my knee's a little, you know, it's not feeling good today. You know, this is, I got hurt in August. This is November. And they was like, oh, well, you know, he sat me down, and then I, I started talking to some people outside of, you know, the, the Badgers. And they recommended me to see some another doctor. And the doctor said I should get an MRI. So I went to get an MRI. And this first MRI revealed I had two torn meniscus in my left knee. Jeez. They never said anything about no meniscus. So now I have two they torn meniscus. They sprained MCL. Yes. And I had like a burst. So they were trying to figure out what was going on. There was a lot of things. And you actually played through? The whole year. That's and then wild. just tore it up worse. <clears throat> and then now... My mom's getting involved. You know, my mom's like, oh, no. Oh, no. You know, this is not about to work. You know, matter of fact, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. I misspoke. We got to rewind it. I'm sorry. My first MRI I got in October. So I got injured in August. Got my first MRI in October. They told me I had a sprained MCL. 
slight tear after the after the MRI. Yes. Yeah, so this was in October. I, I misspoke. This is in October. They said I had a sprain, medial, and lateral. But the lateral was more torn than medial. Medial was slight. That was in October. Played a couple more games. Now the bowl game comes. So now I'm doing the whole practicing. I'm limping, and, and, and you know I'm like I don't know. It's, you know something wrong with my knee. Blah blah blah. So then I get my second MRI in November. So now I get my second MRI. It's worse. The medial tear is more, and then the lateral tear is torn completely and flipped. So that means I have clicking in my knee that's from that. And they've been telling me it's from <laughs> some other stuff. You know, so that year was like, and this is kind of like where it goes into me getting undrafted. It's a little, I think it's my, actually my first time on camera actually speaking about it. No, um, I've told people about it, you know, and it's bittersweet for me when I say, when I talk about Wisconsin, because I feel like, you know, some powers that, that, that had, that were there at the time, you know, kind of like messing me up from getting drafted. Do you, do you think, I mean, look, everyone's got a job to do and uh, every coach has to win yeah. and uh, I'm not saying anything was unintentionally but at the same time you know they want the best players in the field and they'll do whatever they can to have you play and you're not getting paid so you don't have like an agent right. you don't have like your own medical staff to double check things you're a kid they're like your parents right. you know for sure so I mean you that, listen to them and you expect them to take care of you that's right you know and when my mom, when all the coaches came to my living room and the brother, and they sat down with my mom, you know, she asked all of them, you know, and I was like a little embarrassed about it, but she was like, I want to know if, if my son gets hurt, you know, what you're going to do. And then Alvarez, Barry Alvarez, head coach in AD at the time, he said, oh, we're going to take care of him no matter what. You know, so now my senior year comes around. Um, I've been dealing with this knee injury, been misdiagnosed. Right. They didn't recommend an MRI till October. And I went up, went to got my second opinion in November, and I've been playing with a misdiagnosed knee that's been getting worse and worse since the beginning of the season. And then when I elected to go ahead and get surgery, they wanted me to play still, even though I had a doctor telling me I should not play, but they wanted me to play. And then I said no. My mom started stepping in at the time, and she was like, no, she's a nurse. She was like, no, not gonna happen. Um, and I didn't want to play because I, I played like crap. I was playing like crap. I was out there hurt. You know, and I wasn't as exposed about as I was. So I decided to have somebody else do my surgery. And then Wisconsin didn't want to pay for my surgery because I didn't use a referral doctor. So that created a whole issue in my senior year from being, you know, going into the season as an All-American. And, you know, I had a DUI in August. I tore my knee up, wasn't voted for captain, even though I was voted for captain my junior year. And it was just a pain filled trying to get, you know, over this injury my senior year to, you know, finish in the senior year, my senior year, so get surgery got before the bowl game. By the NFL. They For they, sure. They, they I had character were, concerns yeah. coming out of, co of like, college. He just get his DUI. He, he couldn't play to the end of the season. Right. You know, what kind of investment? He probably could have been. So maybe second, third. That's that was projected. It was second to second fourth third. round. Yeah, I um, can see that for sure. My my one of my brothers, DeAndre Levy, he played alongside of me. He was Sam strong side linebacker. I was the wheel weak side linebacker, and our stats were very comparable. My numbers were better than his just throughout the board. Um, I was faster, like I performed better than him. But he got drafted in the third round, and he was supposed to get anywhere from the fourth to undrafted, and I was supposed to get second to fourth. He got drafted in the third. And that day, he got drafted. I was so happy for him. So happy. Get my brother, you know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. when he got drafted, I'm like, oh, I know I'm about to get drafted. Oh, yeah, you're like, if he... You know, my done. boy going, I know I'm going to get called. Yeah. Man, and this was when it was the first and second round on the first day, and three through seven on the second That was 02? Oh, two? oh, 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 nine. oh, nine. Oh, nine. Yeah. What year am I at? Yeah, so the third round just started. He got drafted by the Detroit Lions. And I didn't get my first phone call to the sixth round. That's like five hours later. I mean, so for those of us that are normal people watching the draft, what's it like when you're waiting for your name to get called? Man. I mean, it, it was similar to like this situation, no cameras, though. A whole bunch of family was around. I had a party. And we're watching TV. 
and we're seeing these guys go. We saw DeAndre get drafted. All these guys you know that you played against. It's right. Like, oh, there were 31 linebackers drafted, and I got my first call at the sixth round. And the ten, it was the the New Orleans Saints. They said they had um, they had uh, matter of fact, it was the fifth round. They said they had one more pick, and they were they were probably gonna take me on that pick. But if not, then they'll definitely come after me. And I'm like, I don't want you. I don't want to. I want to yeah. get drafted. Yeah. Ten did the same thing. Said, call me in the sixth round. And they said, oh, we got two seventh round draft picks. We're planning on taking you for, for you know one of those draft picks. Neither one of those calls came. But as soon as the draft was over, I started getting phone calls. The Saints, Tampa Bay, they both called me. But at this point, I could choose, you know, and I, I elected to choose the Saints who were only giving me $7,000 as a signing bonus compared to Tampa, who were going to give me thirty. But you know what I did? I looked at the quarterbacks. You know, I looked at the situation. Because you were smart. You were stupid. I, I did my due diligence. Um, and one of the, the agencies that I was a part of, we had an athlete there called Jonathan Vilma. Who we know, Jonathan. We just Remember yeah. John Vilma? Yeah. How good a relationship we have? Yeah. That was the bottle smash. Yeah. But... He the was there, the and I called him, yep, and I called him before I signed with the Saints, and, you know, he kind of gave me a little rundown, and he was big bro to me. He's still big bro to me. He took me under his wing my rookie year, and Tampa Bay had three wins. And New Orleans had 16 wins. We went 13-3 and three in the regular season, and we won a Super Bowl that year. So I made that little, you know, $23,000 back. That's right. <laughs> I'm so proud of you for that because that's – I mean, you followed your gut, and uh, I mean, they say challenges make champions, and you certainly had your challenges your senior year. <coughs> you didn't deserve to go undrafted, but maybe you got a third round. So what happened to your friend? They got drafted in the third round. How long did he play for? Played a long time, seven, eight years, but he's a good player. Yeah. Good player. Great man, great player, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, there was other, like, I was one of the last guys out of that whole group. That year was a strong year for linebackers. That was a year, it was all the USC guys. So it was Brian Cushing, Clay Matthews, Malawuga, and Mayava, um, Brian Aragpo, um, Aaron Curry. There was a lot strong of strong linebackers. linebackers that year. A lot of guys that had long careers. James Laurinaitis had long yes. careers. You know, first round draft picks, a lot. Wasn't mad at those dudes, but there were some other dudes. I didn't yeah, know who they yeah. were. <laughs> you you think like seven names, but there was, 20, it was 31 guys, bro. You You're right, up. right. <laughs> so you go to the Saints, and I mean, you had instant success. You were telling me how um, right out at training camp, you know, you made an impact, and you played a lot as a as a rookie and got a lot of time and you recovered the fumble. Yeah, <laughs> I was doing my cardio last weekend, and I saw I saw it on the NFL Network. And yeah, I shot you it text, came up on the game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, what was it like to win to win? I mean, the NFL Super Bowl. Did you ever was that ever in the plan, or is the plan when you get the NFL to have because you can't so much that you control, you know, was it 45, 52 men roster, fifty three, yeah, fifty three men yeah, roster, forty six on game day, forty six game day. So it's not like you were playing the NBA where it's like okay, I'm gonna choose to play with LeBron and we got a good chance to win. There's so many things go into being on an NFL team for sure. You know, and um, to be honest, my rookie year, it <laughs> was not looking to win no Super Bowl. You know, that wasn't a goal of mine. If right. I sat here and say it was a goal to win two Super Bowls, it wasn't. Not after, not before the first one. My goal was just make the make team. team. You know, make the team and play. You know, and um, the, the, the thing is about these Super Bowl teams, you know, every single part fits in perfectly. You know, I'm this little kid from Jersey City come in with a messed up knee who ended up making the biggest play, you know, at that point. You know, in Super Bowl history, history yes, um, it definitely one of the biggest plays in the Saints, you know, organization history. I would say it's the biggest play in the Saints history, and especially Steve after Gleason blocked it. You can't take that to block punt Steve Gleason when he they blocked it, it and you recovered. No, that wasn't it. That was talking about in '06, yes, when they were playing um, Mike Vick and they oh, yes, reopened yes, it yes, after yes, Katrina. Yes, yes, people are gonna argue yes, that, and yes. I, I will argue that too. Yes, for sure. That was huge. But play. you brought it home, though. Yeah, 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 I mean, I'm the one. I'm, I'm the one. Um, and when we when you watch the play, um, you see the play starts off, and I don't get it until the scrum is already going on. I just dive in there. When I dove in there, I had the ball in my hands, and I did not let that ball go. What was until it like? The last to, blue glove came. What was it like to be at that moment and have your hands on that pigskin? It was unreal, cause you know the way 
The play is called Ambush. Let me give you a little history on this play. Thomas Moore said, who was that fifth round draft pick that the Saints were supposed to use on me? That was on Thomas Moore said. Who's still a punter now, my good friend. Love the kid. So they got him in you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it was, I was undrafted. They had Thomas Moore said, and then Malcolm Jenkins was the other rookie that played. No other rookies played. It was just us three. I was the undrafted guy. Greg Williams, our D coordinator, he gave me a lot of crap that year. Um, but the play was called Ambush. And Thomas Morstead can kick the ball on the side and spin it like a top. I've never seen no one do that. And people think that, oh, you know, just did it that game. We've been practicing it every single week. And it did the same thing. Now, you know for an onside kick, when you kick the ball, it has to go 10 yards before the kicking team yes. can touch the ball at all. Yes. His kick would spin past 10 yards and come back. No way. Like a top. And if you watched it, it did that. And it bounced off one of their guys, and it bounced back into one of our guys' hands. But he never had control of it. It was like underneath him. So when I dove in there, I had the ball in my hand. And after that, I felt like I was in the dip for like an hour. <laughs> it was everything going was it on. Like, I mean, it was, it was like, like underneath the scrum. Was that, punching, that scrum was like 10 minutes. It. it was crazy. It felt like forever. But all I kept hearing was white ball, white ball, white ball. And Sean Payton is such a – he's such a, a, a football just uh, – a genius, football genius, you know. He's a Bill Parcells lineage, you know. Bill Parcells got a couple special guys that I've actually played for. Coughlin, Bilicek, and, and Sean and Sean Payton. And they asked him which way he wanted to kick it. I don't know if they, they – I think they said it on the yes. special. Yep. And he was like, I want to kick it that way. He switched his mind, though. Right, he switched it because yes. if you kick it, it would be towards the New Orleans come, sideline. Yes, and you yes. got all New Orleans saying, he, he, he said, white, said white, I want it towards my sideline. And it, and it worked. And, and it worked. Um, and if – you can't really see it, but – there was a referee sitting on me, <laughs> and he was like, white ball. So once he said white ball, I let go of the ball. So when I let go of the ball, Chris Reese got up with it, yeah, you know, yeah. and ran around with it. And everybody's yeah. like, I thought you recovered it. Yeah. I got accredited for it, Yes. but Chris Reese got up with it. Yes. But if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for me, the Colts would have had it. That's right. So I would never take away anything from anybody, you know, that was involved in the play. Thomas Morstead, Chris Bree, Sean Payton with the call, and then me busting in there and helping the guys out. Challenging their champions, and you yeah. wanted. Tell me what it's like to play middle linebacker uh, in the NFL. Um, you know, it's it's like being a quarterback on the defense. You know, um, you you got to know the defense like the back of your hand. You got to be able to make checks and adjustments, just like the offense, just like the quarterbacks do. Um, and it's playing. You play chess. You know. Um, Mostly, most of the other positions are a lot of one-on-one -on -one battles. You know, um, corner is probably the most physical, demanding position on defense um, because you go against literally the best athletes in the world. One-on-one. Receivers. On one. Receivers. You know what I mean? Um, but as far as, like, as you get closer to the ball, you know, you've got to be a little bit more engaged, you know, um, and it's not just a physical thing. You know, it's a lot more mental. You know, um, these offenses, these quarterbacks, man, they're smart. The Drew Breeses of the world, the Tom Brady's, you know, they will look at a, at, a, at a alignment and know exactly what coverage you're in. And they will look at an alignment that you're disguising and know that because the safety's down or the safety's over two yards that you're in the, de the defense. And these offenses, they're built to go against these defenses. So they have, you know, um, vulnerability – and the quarterbacks, they all know it. So as a the guy on this side who's doing quarterback on defense, it's that chess match that goes on before the snap, after the snap. Where's your eyes? Maybe you show him blitz, but you actually get back because you know he's gonna throw that hot route to the tight end because you show him. You know what I mean? It's it's a whole it's a whole game you play and and, and when it gets to to being the beauty of, of playing football, that's when it comes to being the beauty of it as a linebacker because there is beauty in a corner covering Odell Beckham and really covering them. You know what I mean? Like there's beauty in that. There's beauty in the edge pass rush from a D end that just kills an all pro tackle. There's beauty in that. 
But there is also beauty in the middle linebacker or outside linebacker dissecting the screen after they've showed run or pass and then flying to make a TFL. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's the beauty in the game. And, and like, I see you smiling because you, you yeah. know, because yeah. you're, you're a football connoisseur. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And I'm a football connoisseur. I'm retired now, but I still appreciate the game. I love watching it. And I love the linebacker position because your, your eyes are on the quarterback a lot of the time. So, you know, you've gone up against some greats. So who's the greatest you've gone up against? I, I'm a, I'm a, I got an A and I got a B. And um, I think we got to give Tom Brady his, his respect because if we're judging on rings, there's no one even close. No one even close. His numbers are amazing. The way he leads the organization is second to none. But I put Drew Brees right next to him. Drew Brees doesn't have – he got one ring, not six. Um, but his numbers are – Unreal. Every year he throws for five thousand yards. Um, you know the the talent changes in New Orleans. I mean now they're loaded. You know, um, and that's why they're competitive. I'm talking about Super Bowl competitive every yes. year. Um, you know the last couple of years, um, and that's a tribute to not only Sean Payton but to Drew Brees. Um, he's a he's a great general on the field, and you know one of the one of the best feelings I've ever had on the football field was when I played for Tampa Bay and I played New Orleans. And we, we played them hard and tough and they ended up um, beating us at the end. It was a low-scoring game. And, you know, the Saints, they don't, they don't do low scoring. No, no, no. 21 <laughs> was like the bottom of it. Right, game. you know, but it was like a 13-17 type of game and they ended up winning. And Drew Brees came over to me and said, Casillas, you're doing a good job, man. Keep up. Bro, that's like one of my highlights of my life. That has to be. You know what I'm saying? Like to hear that acknowledgement from Drew Brees, you know, and – you know, I've seen him at the golf tournament. Yes. The first person I saw that day was Drew, and it was just good, and I thanked him for everything, just the little stuff that he would do like that. Yep. That means a world of difference. And uh, and, and where does uh, Peyton fall in that in that legacy of those two to you? Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning. Um, in, in, our, in our time, you know, in the uh, 2000s, you know, I think you got to – you got to put those three up there at the top. You know, I think Tom's number one overall in any, you know, generation. Um, but then when you come to numbers, Drew and, and, and Peyton are number one, you know, one and two, you know, for every statistical category. And um, Peyton got two rings, you know, so he's right up there. But I won't give him the nod over Drew. Right. Drew beat him in the Super Bowl. That's right. One on one. You, get you know what I'm saying? Too. And so you told me you felt like you know when you made it when Peyton recognized you it was like, see it's watching him fifty two right? Yeah, you Drew, Drew Brees. Yeah, oh, Drew, Drew checked Brees, his line, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, man, you know, um, you know, there, there was, there was moments when you feel like you've arrived, you know, and that was my my fifth year in the league, um, but at that point I was I wasn't the special teams young kid anymore, right. like I was a legit linebacker in the yes. NFL. You know, and um, we all have those, you know, welcome to NFL moments. Like, my welcome to NFL moment was my first game against the Buffalo Bills in Buffalo. Some of my family was there. My father was there. Um, and my first play was kick return. And now, any rookies out there that, you know, or even second-year guys that just went through their rookie season that played. As a rookie, when you play, you hang out with other rookies, you know, majority of the time. Some of those guys are playing, some were not. So when you're out there, they're all watching you. You know what I mean? Like, of course they're watching, you know, whoever else is out there, but if those are your you're boys, <laughs> yeah. they're watching you. So I look, I got the L3 on kick return, which is the third guy in. Um, and I, I went down and I turned around. It was a fullback. He hit me so hard, bro. <laughs> Boom, straight helmet to helmet. Boom, I went on my back. Bow, and I landed, and my head hit the ground. <laughs> Your voice <was> and, the, <laughs> and, you know, I got up like, damn, like, I, I got to get my pads lower, yeah. you know? And I went to the side, and all my boys was like, look. <laughs> <laughs> laughing at you? <laughs> they, were, they were laughing. And then they said that. They was like, bro, you got to get your pads down, bro. We going to tear you up out there. Um, but that was like my welcome to the NFL moment, you know, and I had a moment like that. And then that year five, 
what Drew said, that was like, now you're a, now you're a, a legit. You're one of us. Linebacker. You're a yeah. legit NFL yeah. player now. You know, before that, I was. You know, I mean, I, I had my role. I started a lot of games for New Orleans. I had a lot. I made a lot of plays on defense, not just special teams. But hearing it from Drew, elite. You know, affirmation. You know, yep. and then to wrap on the football conversation, you also won with the with the Patriots, and you're the first person to touch that shiny trophy when it came out. Right? <laughs> you were the, made it, you were made the, it a point to get yeah, to that. You got trophy. the line first. So I'm not missing this one. I've been there before. <laughs> and so you told me that the, the Patriots are different because they're prepared on like Tuesday. Yep. Where most other teams start preparing on Tuesday, they're already prepared. <clears throat> yeah, that's just that. You know, um, my I got traded to the New, to the New Orleans. Um, to the New Orleans. I got traded to the Patriots on a Tuesday. Right before the trade deadline, the trade deadline was like four o'clock. I think I got traded at three fifty eight. <laughs> you know, it was right right on the cusp. Um, and then Bill Belichick called me right away. Right away, and Casario was a GM, and um, you know he was like, "Hey, there's an eight o'clock flight. You know, I want you on from Newark to uh, to Boston." I'm like, eight o'clock. I mean, uh, not in Newark. I was in Florida. I was in Tampa. Excuse me. It's mid season, um, and I'm like, I got a dog, like in a pit yeah. bull. Yeah, my kids. I what live here. Like, what do you mean? Yeah. You know, so he was like, I really want you because, you know, you're playing Sunday and I expect you to be at practice tomorrow in the meetings. So I'm like, all right, um, you know, I guess I'm going to do it. And, you know, luckily my brother was around and, you know, he was able to take care of my dog. But it's, it's weird when you get traded because, you know, I, I'm living in Tampa. You know, it's it's October, uh, the end of October and early November. You know, it's it's beautiful. 80 degrees, you know. <laughs> I don't own a jacket down there, you oh, know. Oh, yeah, you're changing your wardrobe. Really. I fly to New England. It's snowing. <laughs> not that I'm not used to snow because I played at Wisconsin and I'm from the East Coast. But I, in Florida, where I live now, I don't own a coat. <laughs> like, all my coats are in my mom's house, like, in the closet, like, tucked away, you know. So I went up there with sweatshirts and everything and, um, you know, that Wednesday when I walked in, the first person I saw at 6.30 in the morning, Tom Brady. And, and that same affirmation to where, like, Drew Brees said what he said two years ago, the year before. Um, you know, when I walked in, you know, I see him, and I'm like, oh, you know, what's up, Tom? You know, what's going on? Yeah. He was like, hey, Casillas, you know, you know, welcome. Good to have you a part of Patriots. You know, I was like, yeah, good to be here. And I walked away like, I'm a That felt pretty good. <laughs> no, yeah. <bro."> yeah. <laughs> So that was my first day in, and um, right away, like I said, it was 6.30. Uh, I asked uh, Pat Graham, who was the linebacker coach at the time, I said, hey, let me get the playbook. Let me get it. Let me, you know, let me know where we're at, where we're going to run, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm ready to get after it. He was like, yeah, we're not, you know, we're not really in the playbook. You know, like, we don't really have a playbook. You know, that was like training camp. I was like, so how am I learning this defense? He gave me three pieces of paper, bro. Three. Three sheets. Double-sided, though. <laughs> Three pieces of paper to learn the defense. And I'm sitting there like, oh, my gosh. Like, there was, I mean, and, and, and it made sense. But at that point, like, I'm, I'm panicking. I need yeah. to learn this defense. I can't learn from six three pitchers pass, yeah. and three 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 pages of, 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 of pitchers and words. Yeah, you're words. the quarterback on the defense. You know what I mean? Like, what? You know, so it ended, it ended up working out um, in practice. But I did have those moments where – my, my um, Jamie Collins, who was the other middle linebacker, and, and, and Hightower was the other middle linebacker as well. Like, they would say something, and like, literally in the play, I'd be like, what? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Never heard that term before. <laughs> um, you know, that was that. Um, but that first meeting, Wednesday, so Wednesday, um, I get in 6.30, I'm, you know, looking at these three pieces of paper that I got to learn the plays, um, and then we have our first team meeting. And then team meeting, um, Bill's conducting it, and um, <coughs> Bill's conducting the team meeting, of course. So he's up front, and he's kind of laying out the team we're playing. And then he starts to ask questions about the defense and the off, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the head coach and the defensive coordinator. And he picks somebody in the audience. He goes, Jimmy Garoppolo, who's the backup quarterback at the time. He's like, Can you give me some information and what do you know about the head coach? And what do you know about the defensive coordinator? And, and what prior relationship did they have before coming to this team? And I'm in my head thinking like, oh my God, 
why is he asking about coaches? And I'm like nervous, bro. And there's <laughs> nothing about no coaches on these three pieces of paper that I got. Um, so I'm like so nervous. And Jimmy started, you know, boom, 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 boom. Head coach went here, boom, boom, boom. He runs this type of, runs this type of uh, you know, system, defense coordinator did this, and he runs this type of system. And so Bill's like, all right, so. Instead of saying good job or that's amazing. Listen, I, listen, yeah. listen. <laughs> He goes, all right, so what's their prior relationship to, you know, to before they got to this team? And Jimmy's like, um, I, I, don't, I don't know. You, you would think that Jimmy was his son and he just flunked out of high school, man. Bill put his head down. He said, Jimmy, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> My heart's beating so hard. Yeah. You probably like sitting down in your Yeah, I'm like, please don't, don't call, don't call me. on me. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, that – Moment was like holy crap, you know. I gotta, I gotta know what's going on with the team I'm playing, not just the players I'm going against. And that was his whole thing. So on Wednesday, he could actually about since I play defense, he could actually about the offense, the offensive coordinator, what type of scheme they like, what they like on first down, second down, third down, who are their running backs and their tight ends. Not only who are the first and second string running backs, who wants. How many catches does a second string running back have? Because if he has more than 10, he's a viable option on third down. If the second string or third string running back, or the first string, anybody, fumbled, you got to know how many times he fumbled. got to know what game he fumbled. Wow. He would ask you a question like this. Hey, Casillas, you know, uh, give me, you know, who are the running backs, you know, that, that you're playing against, and uh, who's their third down guy? And this is asking Wednesday morning, 8 o'clock. We just got our playbooks the night before on the, online. So... Usually, for every team I've ever played for, you get your information either Tuesday or Wednesday. For every, every week, that's just how the week goes. And you start to study on Wednesday. Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock in those Patriots meeting, you better know who you're playing against. You better know. You're going to get called out. It's not going to be cool. He doesn't yell. Right. But it's just, you know, it's like when you want, when you want to make your parents proud, you know, and, and you have pride in doing, you know, we're all prideful men. You know, you don't have to yell at a professional. You don't have to demean them. You don't have to encourage and motivate them. They're going to do it on their own. You know, so after that, I was prepared every Wednesday. That's right. Every Wednesday. And I was prepared for special teams, too, because I heard he might ask special teams questions. So I was prepared for that, too. And I think that level of preparation um, for every week, for every game, that approach to it, that's why they only have a couple pieces of paper, because every game plan is different. And that's the reason why I believe, of course, the culture – but I think, I think that's a huge part of the culture itself in uh, New England. And that actually translates to everything else that we do, to life, to business, to family, to, to kids, is, is to be prepared. For sure. Because, you know, as I talk to people in real estate and whatever, every meeting you have, you don't know who's going to be there, and you got to be ready. So what are you doing now? Because you're so passionate, you're such a huge giver, your foundations, your two-on-two. Let's talk about the stuff you're doing post two championships. Well, I started the Four Progress Camp um, six years ago. We just had our sixth camp in June. Um, and it was tremendous. And I went to a couple camps as, you know, as an assistant or helping a coach, you know, as an NFL coach, helping other guys. And I was like, oh, I got I to gotta do something like this. But I wanted to put my own spin on it. I want to put my name on it. And I met with... Um, New Brunswick Tomorrow, which is a, a company in New Brunswick that basically um, they work with Bristol Myers, Square, Johnson and Johnson and Bruckers to better New Brunswick to bring in more companies. But they've been using my likeliness for a very long time because I was a scholar athlete back in 2005. Right. You know, so I've had an ongoing relationship with them, and they were um, uh, one of the main contributors and sponsors to Play It Smart. But that was a program that I grew up in in high school where they did SAT prep, after school study hall, and a lot of community service. That's right. So I was always a part of that. So I sat with them and I, I developed this Fort Progress camp. And of course, the term Fort Progress is a football term. And it's basically, for the people that don't know, it's like when an offensive player, running back, quarterback, whoever that has a ball, they're moving forward and they get stopped. And then they get taken back and tackled. But as we all know, that ball gets moved up, and that's called, that's called forward progress. You know, and, and, and that's 
conceptually what I'm trying to like instill in the children. You know, it's all about the forward progress. You keep know? moving forward. You're gonna get hit back. You know, but as long as you have that thought that you want to keep going forward, that's all that really matters. You know, because you're gonna be able to make strides. You're gonna be able to make gains. You're gonna be able to get that yard or two yards. Yeah, and maybe ironically, had you not had that senior with the Badgers, you wouldn't be able to speak on it like you're speaking on it. For sure. For sure, I have you know I, I have a lot of perspective on a lot of different things. You know, I've been through a lot, I've experienced a lot, and uh, I listen. You know, one thing that I feel like I've I've done a lot in my life, I've listened to people around me. You know, I've heard you know not the negative stuff. I hear it, but that goes in and out. Um, you know, but all the constructive criticism, all the criticism, all the you know the uh, the cues and the technique from the coaches and. You know, I'm getting in the business now, um, moving this forward progress camp from a one-day camp deal to a, a movement. Um, yes. You know, so next up on the agenda. Oh wait, let me get let me dive fully dive into the forward progress camp. So what I created was a life skills and football camp. Now it's open to all New Brunswick athletes, and at first we were giving them cleats. But the sizing was a was a difference. But the reason why I wanted to give them cleats from the beginning, because I want the kids that can't afford cleats. I want those kids. Those are kids I want in my camp. And it doesn't have to be football players. You know, we have uh, self-contained kids. We have a lot of girls, and they have a great time at the camp. But what we do is we give them life skills courses in the morning, and they come in. We give them. Uh, we had a, a fantastic keynote speaker this year, John Paul Gonzalez, and he speaks for the Giants, the FBI, I mean, all all over the country and all over the world. Um, and he, he set the tone in the morning for being all in. And the kids, we give them free notebooks, backpacks, shirts, T-shirts, uh, cool. pencils, so cool. all for progress stuff. And, you know, we take care of them. We give them meals. And they go into these, they go into these classrooms with the mindset that, you know, these same athletes, mm -hmm. like, that look forward to the seven-on-seven, -seven, we make sure that they have the same type of mindset going into these classrooms. We all just want to get better, you know, and I'm bringing in John Vilma Spoke. He's a public speaker, so he talk about, you know, public speaking. We had the deer cops there, you know, talking about like drug awareness and, um, you know, what the ins and outs of social media. David Tyree was one of our speakers. That's cool. And uh, his topic was dreaming big. You know, he had the helmet catch, catch helmet. in yep. the Super Bowl, and he was prepared for it, and he kind of explained that whole, uh, whole deal. We had Al Pettipus, who started Play It Smart, right. um, and I'm following him up, and I see all the kids there, and they're dancing around, and, you know, it, it was it was, it was was such a good turnout this year. Um, and as you can see, that's my baby. That's my pride and joy. I love that. Um, and now we're adding things to it. So this year we, we, uh, we added the Empowerment Through Literacy Tour, and it was to read across America. And I took 14 schools in the state of New Jersey and I read to the schools. Um, two schools in Newark, a school in Ridgefield Park, my daughter's school, and then 10 schools, which was every single K through eight in New Brunswick. And I read to the kindergartners, first graders and second graders, and all the third through eighth graders I had an assembly for, just talking about the importance of literacy and opportunity and taking advantage of it. Um, and then the next thing we have on the agenda is next month um, in August, um, the next thing we have in the agenda is August 17th. We have the two on two tournament. And basically, we're going to raise money for scholarships. You know, um, I got a company that's willing to, you know, donate the jerseys. And we got Sick. the park, you know, um, Love that. Uh, uh, secured recreation park. It's called Pine Street Park. And we grew up with the Pine Street two on two tournament back in, back in the day in New Brunswick. And it was like a, a pretty premier that's event. Wild. And it brought people together. Now I want to do that again because it doesn't exist anymore. I love it. Bring people together before a good cause. Not the winner is not getting a money prize. The winner is the winner is going to have a scholarship in their name. That's beautiful. All these things are just reasons why uh, you are who you are. I mean, you showed up, you got kicked down, you got pushed back, and it's forward progress all the way through. All the way through. You know, um, great example. This has just been so much fun. Uh, I mean, I could talk football for like 30 hours. You know, <laughs> for like sure. A football fan, and I want to know everything about the game from the television. I can't get it, but I feel like I'm getting a front row seat to the a real game talking to you. So, um, what advice would you give to um, an athlete? Because your, your career is only beginning. 
you the things you're going to do to empower people. Um, your career got you here. It's going to get you to ridiculous places. So the young athlete or the young person that wants to make a difference in their lives, um, that wants to be like you, what do you say to them? What's your advice? Well, you got to work. You know, you, you got to appreciate the hard work. You know, you got to appreciate the grind. You know, uh, that whole process, you know, that whole work process is where you really find out what you're truly made of. You know, and, and you, you might find out things about yourself during that process that you probably never knew knew before. You know, um, once we we get into certain situations where we, we, we face adversity right. and um, we face pressure, right. you know, um, you know, where maybe there's a young kid that they just drafted, yeah. you know, that's coming in to take your spot and he's all everything, you know, and um, what that's type true. of man are you? That's though? true. You know, what, what type of man are you? You know, are you going to go ahead and help him? You gonna go ahead, or are you gonna be like the guy that shields him off because you're afraid of losing your job? Right. You know. Um, but you know, when I when I when I talk to all of these kids, you know, I always talk about the importance of hard work, but then also taking advantage of opportunities. You know, and in order for you to take advantage of them, you have to be able to see them. You have to be. You have to welcome them. Right. You know, some people are, are a little afraid to take that first step because they don't know how big that first step is, and they don't know how steep those stairs are. You know, it might be a long way up, you know, but as we know, the long way up is always a long way up when it's good. You know what I mean? The, the, the short, you know, the short steps, the quick, so the easy ones, you know, it's not as good when you get to the top, you know, but the, the drawn out, the process, you know, appreciating the hard work, taking care of your body, doing what you're supposed to do off the field, being a good person, you know what I mean? All of those things are just those steps, you know what I mean? And, um, Talk about those two things and just being great at everything you do. You know, don't don't be half pregnant. You know, don't 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 half ass stuff. Don't do it. Half you know, because if you you out there BSing, you're gonna get BS results. You know, if you're gonna do it, do it right. You know, do it right. Do it to your utmost potential, and then you can actually see what your potential truly is. Beautiful thing. From challenges to a two-time champion. Uh, thanks for being a good friend and showing up and giving us your story. Uh, I could talk all day long, but I'll save it for another time. <laughs> My friend, you have the hustle. Thank you, Ben. To follow our story, check us out at benanderson.365 on Instagram and stay tuned for our next honored guest.